you can't say that this men without work thing is because there isn't any work for the men. Millions and millions of those jobs are not for like hedge fund managers or, you know, chemical engineers. A lot of jobs where the main qualification is showing up on time every day, not stoned. And even so, employers have not been able to fill these millions and millions of extra jobs. How did you come upon the topic of male unemployment? Uh, I make my living off of uh, finding things that are hiding in plain sight. I've been doing this for over 40 years. Uh, started during the Cold War, uh, looking at the Soviet health crisis, looked at problems of poverty in the U.S. This particular one came to me about 10 years ago when I was hearing happy talk about the uh about the full employment or near full employment situation in the United States from the Federal Reserve, from politicians, from Wall Street. And I was also reading things which said that half of Americans said we were in a recession. So those two things don't really go together terribly well, do they? So I was thinking, so what's what's the problem here? And I pulled on the thread and realized very quickly what the problem was. Our national employment statistics system was developed uh, to track the, uh, the Great Depression. And during the Great Depression times, you'd want to know how many people were unemployed. You'd want to know how many people were employed. And if a guy uh, was neither working nor looking for work, you wouldn't even think this would be a great, uh, <laughs> a great phenomenon, that it would be kind of like a, you know, a, little, a little bit of an end game. Today, it turns out that we've got four prime age men for the 25 to 54s, we've got four times as many guys who are neither working nor looking for work as actually unemployed, as out of a job and looking for a job. So if you're only looking at the unemployment number, you're missing four-fifths of the problem. That's how I stumbled across it. What does that turn into in terms of actual numbers? Well, uh, more than 7 million, I'll, I'll get really nerdy on you, um, more than 7 million men between the ages of 25 and 54, the prime ages for obvious reasons, um, who are in the civilian non-institutional population. Civilian, because we're not counting military, non-institution, because we're not counting prisoners or people who are in you know, mental or health facilities. In other words, people who could reasonably be expected to be in the workforce looking for a job. What sort of men are in this group? Demographically, education, family structure, ethnicity, who makes up this group? Well, as you would guess, Chris, uh, if there are 7 million guys, there's some of everything, right? <laughs> That's a big number. But some are more in represented than others. So <clears throat> um, ethnically, African Americans are overrepresented. But if we go into the persons of color formulation, uh, Latinos and Asian Americans are underrepresented. So, uh, so for white, non-white, it's almost a wash. Um, education's what you'd think. Uh, high school dropouts, way overrepresented. Um, with just high school, quite overrepresented. But surprisingly large, um, we say, representation of uh, guys with college or even college degrees. 40% of this group has at least some college, and as I recall, about a fifth or a sixth are college grads. Uh, here's a funny one. Marital structure, family structure. Uh, it turns out that um, married guys, no matter what their ethnicity, uh, are way less likely to be in this pool. They're way more likely to be out looking for work or having work. Uh, guys who've never been married, way more likely to be in this pool. And it's not just uh, the, the wedding ring, although that obviously is a big predictor. If, you, uh, if you're living under the same roof with kids and you're a guy, you're way more likely to be looking for work. I mean, that kind of that's not surprising to me, but it's you know kind of like the provider effect or something. And last but not least, uh, the Census Bureau has something that they call nativity, which seems kind of weird to me. It sounds like a Christmas scene. Uh, it's what they mean is where you're born. Are you born overseas or native born? Uh, 
foreign born guys are way more likely to be not in this pool, um, no matter what their ethnic background, uh, more likely than their counterparts. And that's not a surprise at to me, and I'm sure it's not a surprise to you in particular, because people who come here from overseas are kind of motivated to do something here, and they're they're more likely to be in the workforce. A lot of overlapping uh, different groups there. I remember hearing you say that a married African-American man is less likely to be in this cohort than an unmarried white American man. Absolutely true. Absolutely true. And uh, in effect, this uh, this little ring kind of overcomes or erases the ethnic differential disadvantage, if you want to call it that. Uh, and there are other things uh, like that as well. If you are a foreign-born guy and you're a high school dropout, your labor force participation is going to be very close to that of a native born college guy. I mean, it, so it's not just, it's not just the disadvantage of the skills, right? I mean, there's something else, there's something else going on. Did you look at a uh, family structure that they came from? Were you able to break this down by single parent household that they'd grown up in? No, I wasn't. I mean, that's a really good question. It's a really good question, but uh, but I I didn't have the information that could uh, could allow me to give you a good answer on that. Okay, so we have uh, up front a rather dramatic seven million person cohort of men in the mm -hmm. U.S., a large chunk of whom are not looking for work. What is the story of modern male unemployment? How do we get to the stage where this is a, a hidden catastrophe? Well, like like so many things in history, it happens gradually. It doesn't come upon us all at once like a meteor strike. Uh, after the end of the Second World War, for about 20 years, the work rates and the labor force participation rates of this group of guys we're discussing, the 25, the 25 to 54 is it's pretty close to a hundred percent, not, not a hundred percent, but pretty close. Um, and it wasn't going anywhere. It was bouncing around a little bit. Then starting in the mid 1960s, things started to change. And from, let's say about 1965, it's a good year to mark it by. It may not be perfect, but it's pretty close. From 1965 to our conversation today, it's been basically a straight line out, out of the workforce of um, men, you know, a flight from work, leaving work, not in labor force, whatever you'd like to call it. And it's eerie if you track this on a graph or a piece of paper. Uh, I did a first edition of a book on men without work in 2016, and I used uh, I used this graph as the cover, which is, I mean, it's almost a straight line. I mean, it's it's not quite uh, geo you know geo astronomy. It's not quite that perfect, but it's pretty close for uh, for the social sciences. And what was really shocking to me was when I came back to do a you know an update after uh, after the pandemic uh, last year. It's almost exactly the same line. I could have taken the cover of that book and just, you know, found a ruler and kept the thing going. Uh, you know, I have no explanation for that. I mean, this is that this is something that happens in the, you know, in the physical sciences. This is not something that happens in the social sciences. So, I mean, it will change eventually, but I was just stunned by that. I heard that since around about 1950 men have retreated from the labor force at around about 0.1% per month solidly is that about right um i'd have to do the i'd have to do the numbers on paper but it's been it has been absolutely relentless and uh you know, i would have started it in the mid 60s for the 1950s uh for 1950s it's more or less a kind of a 
slightly bouncing line with no trend that I could divide. Okay. Uh, so, but, uh, well, economies, demographics, mm-hmm. you know, unemployment, we go through yep. peaks and troughs, we go sure. through cycles, boom and bust. Right. How have you managed to find, like, explain to me the underlying dynamic that has managed to create a, a ruler shape? Uh, yeah. All right. Um, well, we can start by the explanations that don't work, right? And uh, because those are always so popular and they're, I think they're called received wisdom, right? So the received wisdom in this area uh, is that this is a phenomenon driven by economic and structural technological change, that we've had this extraordinary revolution since the end of the Second World War, which is true. And we've had this tremendous uh, set of technological changes, and that's true. And we've had this big uh, shift in demand, less demand for less skilled labor, true. Uh, Outsourcing, true. China enters the World Trade Organization, true, 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 true. Okay. But that's But that's not the whole story, and it's not even most of the story, I don't think. If it were most of the story, you couldn't get a straight line like the one I'm describing to you because we have a business cycle, right? I mean, we've got boom and bust periods, and you two go up and down. Mm -hmm. Uh, You'd see a big, you'd see a big kapow when, uh, China enters the World Trade Organization. You'd see a big disruption, doesn't show up. Uh, you know, when we have our, you know, beautiful little monsters that, you know, disrupt all our technology, you know, you'd see something. Mm-hmm. So <clears throat> that's not happening. What else isn't happening? Well, um, if you take a look at men with less skills, um, they are not all, you know, uh, commonly disadvantaged in the labor force. Uh, if you take a look at foreign born guys who are high school dropouts, but they're married, their uh, work rates and uh, labor force participation rates are indistinguishable, as I mentioned, from college-born, I mean, college guys are domestic. Uh, On the other hand, if you take a look at a native-born guy who's never been married, it's a disaster. It's like 50% or less uh, chance of being even in the workforce. So in this group that's supposedly homogenous, they're like, 40 percentage points of difference in participation. So that part doesn't work so well either. Um, The the really biggest, I think, challenge to this uh, idea uh, is the the extraordinary peacetime labor shortage that we're having now, which at at, at the time of our conversation, 10 or a million unfilled jobs in the United States. So you can't say that this men without work thing is because there isn't any work for the men. And millions and millions of those jobs are not for like hedge fund managers or, you know, I don't know, you know, chemical engineers. There are um, a lot of jobs where uh, the main qualification is showing up on time every day, not stoned. And, uh, and even so, employers have not been able to fill these millions and millions of extra jobs. Is that that employers can't get somebody to come and do the job without getting them fired? Or is that that people simply aren't applying for the jobs? Uh, there are a lot of jobs that people aren't applying for. I mean, we've, we, have, we have seen a spike of about 4 million in the total number of unfilled jobs since the eve of the pandemic, we have also seen a slump of about 4 million total uh, in the size of the workforce by comparison to what we would have expected from the pre-COVID trends. Not all of these are guys, I hasten to say. We're seeing now a sort of a um, new face to the flight from work in America. But the problem with the you know, men fleeing the workforce was the original origin of, of all of this. How many women are added into this cohort? Um, if you count, if you count women who are over the age of fifty-five, a considerable number. There are some under fifty-five as well. 
Uh, there is a problem that is, one might say, no bigger than a man's fist on the horizon heading towards us, which is the kind of the doppelganger, the uh, uh, women without work. Uh, I'll, mention, I'll tell you that in a moment. But if we look at the 55 plus group, um, they account for more than half of the shortfall that I just mentioned to you. Uh, and this is a very new phenomenon because from the, from the, from the fifties until about the nineties, uh, American men and women were kind of starting to enjoy the notion of retiring early, but from the mid nineties up to the, uh, eve of COVID, um, these older workers were basically the only bright uh, spot in the American labor tableau. Uh, their work rates were going steadily up. Their labor force participation rates were going steadily up. But since then, there's been a shock and a drop. And despite the rollout of COVID, of vaccines and everything else, they haven't come back to the workforce. Getting back to this big cohort of invisible men, yeah. how are they surviving and paying for life? Mm. Well, um, as best I could, uh, as best I could figure out as a research nerd, um, you know, kind of looking at statistics and, you know, in, on, the, on my computer in the basement, um, it looked to me as if there's a couple of different factors, uh, girlfriends and family, as long as you count uncle Sam as part of the family, um, uh, people are, there are, quite a large number of these guys who are living with people, I mean, uh, either cohabiting or at home with parents or others. Uh, and that's helping to pay the bills. Uh, what's also helping to pay the bills uh, is, as I said, uh, the U.S. government, in particular, uh, our disability programs for people who are unable to work. Those programs seem to have morphed away from their original humane intention and now seem to provide an alternative income source to regular employment for s several millions, for actually for millions and millions of these guys. How many? What's the, what's the proportion? This is a really hard question to answer, uh, and, but I'll, I'll do my best. The, it should be an easy question. You should be able to go to an office in Washington and ask a bureaucrat how many checks are being cut for people who are on disability. I mean, taxpayers want to know, right? I mean, it sounds like a pretty easy thing. Mm -hmm. The reason it's not easy is because we have a crazy quilt of disability programs that don't play nice with each other. Uh, so the Social Security Administration has three different programs that kind of talk to each other. Then there's the Veterans Administration that has veterans benefits. Then there's uh, workmen's comp programs all around the country. Then there are state level uh, disability programs. There are probably others that I don't even know about. And as best I could figure out from you know, trying to draw in these, you know, draw in the dragnet. Uh, before COVID, over half of the guys who were in this 7 million pool um, were obtaining at least one of these benefits. So many of them were obtaining more than, more than one. And about two thirds were living in a home that was getting at least one of these benefits. Now, I would hasten to add that these are not um, these are not princely prizes that these guys are getting. It's pretty penurious. But with the add-ons from other welfare benefits, which you can um, become eligible for through disability, is enough to provide this alternative to working life. Okay. So that may be able to get them by. Given the fact that they're not working, not in education, employment, or training. What are they doing? What are, uh, what, are they, what are they spend their time doing? Well, we only know what they say they're doing, and we know what they say they're doing because they answer surveys that Uncle Sam sends them sometimes. The, uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, has this 
annual program it calls an American Time Use Survey, and it asks thousands and thousands of people, what do you do from the moment you get up in the morning till the time you go to sleep, and how long do you sleep? So they don't just ask people who are working. They, just pe- they ask people who are adults of all ages. Um, so we've got a fair you know, a fair number of returns from the neither working nor looking for work guys, right? Now, I hasten to say, everybody is a liar and surveys are full of lies, but we can take this, you know, self-reported information as a first cut. They they say they basically don't do um, civil society. Uh, almost no worship, almost no uh, charitable work, almost no volunteering. Uh, they got a lot of time on their hands. We know that. But they do surprisingly little housework. They say they do surprisingly little housework and surprisingly little help with other people in the home. What they say they do a lot of is watch screens. Now, these surveys don't tell you what they're watching or how they're watching it, just, you know, that their screen time. About 2,000 hours a year. Okay. Now, 2,000 hours a year would qualify as a fair full-time job. I mean, maybe not if you're in a law firm, but pretty much anywhere else, it would qualify as a pretty, uh, pretty good full-time job. And, um, the skill which they're developing is being in front of a screen on a couch. Um, and to make the, the situation even more dispiriting than that sounds, every so often these surveys have a little extra component of questions. And before the, um, before the pandemic, one of these components was, do you take pain medication? And about half of these guys said, yes, I take pain medication every day. Now, it doesn't say what the medication is, doesn't say if it's actually a prescription, uh, but that's a lot of people sitting on their couches in front of screens stoned. Am I right in saying that what you've just said is, of this neat 7 million cohort, mm-hmm. on average, they spend around about 2,000 hours per year watching screens, mm-hmm. and of this same cohort, Half of them are taking daily pain medication of one kind or another. That's that's what they say, and I, sh- I should be a little careful about the uh, not in labor force versus neat. Uh, about ten percent, or slightly more than ten percent, of these guys are basically full time students. Uh, they they're getting ready, they're training to get back to work. Their time use looks like an employed guy's time use. So right. we're talking about six plus million who are in the neat pool i was going to say it's a, a it's a, a silver lining around a cloud to say well there is 10 percent. the 10 percent it's not all seven million but Got it's you. a big number it's, it's a still, big almost number. all of them okay yeah what about the way that being uh, having a criminal record gets folded into this <clears throat> well chris once again uh, there is no office you can go to in Washington, and Washington has a great many offices that can tell you how many uh, how many adult felons there are in the U.S. or how many prime age guys have a criminal record. Um, and I tried <laughs> I tried to get at that, and uh, the best I could do was to use some uh, I think pretty good work by some uh, you know, defiant demographic nerds who tried to reconstruct the whole post-war period of crime and punishment, how many people had survived over the long period, how many had gone back to jail. Um, they estimated that as of 2010, there were 19.5 million adults, overwhelmingly men in the United States, who um, had a criminal record. And with a reasonable back of the envelope estimates, that would take us to about 25 million today. We know that the U.S. has got this famous mass incarceration thing going on, but the prisons have got about 2 million uh, people in them. You know, that means that for every person who's behind bars, there are 10 million or more, uh, or 10 or more, who um, you know, 
are in society as a whole in general and not uh, not behind bars have a, have a criminal record. Um, my my own uh, back of the envelope, and I can't be too you know can't be too precise about this given the uncertainties. But my own back of the envelope is that about one in seven adult guys has a criminal conviction in his background in the United States of America at this point, and probably slightly more than that in the prime age group. So we're talking about a lot of, uh, a lot of guys with uh, convictions in their background who are kind of invisible to our statistics. But from what little evidence of our senses, uh, you know, we can draw upon, they're way more likely uh, you know, not to be at work, to be in this kind of pool. Have you got any idea whether that's because they're struggling to be accepted for jobs because they have to list the fact that they do have a, a felony record? You know, it's maddening. Um, that's It's maddening because I can't give you uh, a straightforward answer to this, uh, which is a terribly important question, and millions of people's lives depend on the answer to it. Um, we... We don't have the evidence in a sort of a statistical way. You know, we've got this world of anecdotes and there are, you know, thousands and thousands of points of light out there that are trying to deal with this, but they're all disconnected. Um, if we had, if we lifted a finger and got this information together, which we could do pretty quickly, um, wouldn't be perfect, but it would shine a big, uh, big light on part of this. We'd have the evidence for evidence-based programs all around the country, um, and we don't have that. There, it's clear that there are some areas where there are restrictions uh, against uh, employment of ex-cons, including the financial sector and other places. Um, there's a whole question about whether the ban the box question, whether there should be a ban the box, whether asking uh, people if they'd had uh, trouble uh is uh, prejudicial. My own contrarian impression is that employers actually end up discriminating more if they don't know the answer to that question. They kind of overestimate on their own part, and they're more likely to um, they're more likely to be suspicious of low, less educated minority uh, young men than if they had the actual information. But that's my impression. So your concern is that, among many, many concerns, is that because we have very, very inferior data to what we should do in order to be able to dig down into this, any interventions that you do want to do to try and fix the problem can be pointing in the wrong direction, they can miss the mark entirely, because we don't know, let's just use the ex-con felony uh, example cohort, you don't know if it's an in intervention that needs to be done on the side of the employer to encourage employers to bring on people who do have criminal records. You don't know if the intervention needs to be to get these people from prison back into looking for jobs, get them into training, get them into the routine. Maybe it's support groups, maybe it's something to do with psychological health. You don't know where this issue is coming from because you have insufficient inferior data. Well, there, there will be people who are working in, you know, God's own trenches, you know, with reentry for ex-cons who will have a wealth of knowledge on this and who can uh, tell everybody more about this. But in terms of numbers and patterns, we're blind on this. As a general observation, we always have to be careful about unintended consequences because there's always a policy and there's always an unintended consequence of the policy. And if you don't ask about both of those, you're not looking at the whole situation. How haven't we heard more about this? Like, how haven't, how haven't we heard about this huge seven million man behemoth? Well, I have some guesses. Uh, I mean, one guess is that this is a disadvantaged group that doesn't fall within the academy and the media's preconceptions of disadvantage. They're um, they're guys. They're of you know prime working age, 
and they don't fit, fit the victim profile terribly well. So, you know, horsemen pass by. I mean, that's part of it. Um, it's also true that in the United States, the, um, these prime age men have not been a menace to society. They've been a menace mainly to themselves. They've been dying of deaths of despair and overdoses. They haven't been out uh, like in the banlieues of uh, Paris, like setting the cars on fire. Uh, so they haven't been getting uh, a lot of attention uh, for themselves. And um, you know, because they're not an organized political group, there is no real constituency for them. So, uh, you know, as long as, so they can be neglected uh, at no great peril for any immediate constituencies in the country. I've heard you talk about the difference between poverty and misery as well. How does that fold in? Um, By any 19th century uh, standard, whether it's in the UK or in the US or Australia or in uh, any of the affluent societies of the 1800s, these guys are rolling in money. I mean, they're the well, they're probably in about the second quintile on average in our consumption scale in the United States. But that would make you a very, very, very wealthy person back in the 1860s or 1870s and in any of our English-speaking countries. So lack of resources, lack of material resources is not the issue here. Um, they, You can be miserable on quite a high standard of living. And the degradation that these men experience or self-inflict to some degree um, is, uh, uh, it's heartrending. And it's a tremendous loss of human potential. But just think of it. I mean, you you don't have to be a philosopher to know that, you know, 2,500 years ago, Aristotle said that, you know, that we're human beings are social creatures. You know, if you're not connected to society and you're a human being, you kind of suffer for it. Uh, that's why, you know, that's why solitary confinement is a, considered a cruel and unusual punishment by some people. Uh, so if you're not connected to work, you're more likely not to be connected to family, uh, likely, more likely not to be connected to faith, although that's an, another story. And you're, you don't even go out of your house to be in your community. Um, you know, that is a pretty miserable baseline. I mean, I can imagine being out of work and spending all of your time doing community gardening or volunteering or, I don't know, um, memorizing Kapital in the original German or something. I mean, something like that, which would be uh, a use of your time uh, that wouldn't necessarily degrade you. But what I've described to you is not that. It's, It's kind of like a path of misery. Yeah, wanking on weed isn't the same as hoeing a garden and and building some flowers. So this is one uh, really, I guess, interesting area that I've spoken about an awful lot recently. I flew to Doha to have a debate about traditional masculinity being degraded and stuff. What do you understand about how men are seeing themselves and their role in the world given this change in terms of what they're doing with work? Well, um, it's, you you don't, you don't have to be a sociobiologist to say that there is something unnatural about society and history's long-term providers suddenly being flipped into this position of dependence. Uh, And you don't have to be Sigmund Freud to think that there might be some sort of psychological fallout from this inversion here. Um, 
whether this speaks to um, greater metaphysical problems in the U.S. or the world is a uh, is a bigger topic. Um, my uh, my boss, uh, Mary Eberstadt, has opined about that at some length, and she's always right. So uh, I will defer to that. I am very interested in the idea of providers becoming dependent and us not having the language or the archetype framing or the guardrails to be able to give them something that makes them feel proud. And then also the distinction between poverty and misery, you know, being told that you are from a uh, benefiting from the past oppressive uh, patriarchal superstructure, which has given you all of the advantages that some other group hasn't had. Meanwhile, guys are, you know, not starving, at least in terms of for money or for food, but very much are for meaning, very much are for social connection, very much are for sobriety. Sure. Um, it's, it just seems to me like the absolute sort of synthesis of everything that performative empathy allows to happen, which is to do what looks good in place of what is good when it comes to trying to enact social policy and campaigning for people that are struggling? Well, I think you've put it very well. Um, You can take a technocratic approach to addressing some of the problems I've described. Um, The nice thing about a technocratic approach is that you can pretend that it is value neutral. But what we're describing here is completely laden with values. And uh, the normative questions of how you find meaning in life and what one does with life and what your purpose is and what, you know, what fills the soul, you know, what fills the hole in your soul is absolutely critical here. And, you know, if we kind of um, pretend, <laughs> pretend none of this really matters, well, you can kind of guess what's going to happen. This, to me, seems to point a rather worrying picture at the potential for UBI. Not that I was a a massive proponent of it in any case, but you mentioned that the pandemic basically caused Washington to stumble into a dress rehearsal for UBI. And we're seeing these guys who have sufficient material wealth to be able to keep them going, but they don't seem to be flourishing. There's a whole argument about whether uh, UBI would bankrupt uh, our public finance system. Uh, that's a separate argument. Um, it's a very important argument, and it might put an end to this discussion right there. I would say, however, um, take a look at the time use of these neat men, and then ask yourself, do you want to buy more of this? Is this something that society should really want to subsidize? Because you're going to get it. You're going to get a lot of people with UBI who have a lot of time on their hands, uh, what are they going to do with it if they don't have the you know, gyroscope for it? Uh, and absolutely, during, uh, uh, during the early months of the pandemic, actually for almost a year and a half in the pandemic, we were dispensing more benefits in pandemic uninsurance uh, than unemployment insurance then we had unemployed people in the United States. At one point, for every 100 people who were unemployed, we had about 250 beneficiaries of pandemic unemployment insurance. So it, it was indeed a, a kind of a test drive. Fortunately, it's over. Uh, what's unfortunate is we don't know how long the lingering effects of it uh, will reverberate or how badly they will reverberate. Would you guess, would you hypothesize that there is going to be a hangover of some kind, that the uh, trend and the the routine that people got into of not working during the pandemic is going to set a habit going forward? I think we're living in it right now. Look around. Um, 10, 11 million open jobs. 
uh, great resignation, giving more bargaining power to people who are job applicants than any time in my long life. Uh, millions of people still sitting on the sidelines more than before the pandemic. That, that sounds to me like uh, like immediate consequences. I mean, what we can see from the labor market is if you stay with the labor market, uh, if you're if you declare yourself unemployed, your chances of getting back to work within a matter of weeks are very high. Once you cut that line, it's a little bit like you know going off onto the space shuttle, and then you're you're kind of out in space, and your odds of uh, doing something other than being a long termer uh, get really bad. I thought that unemployment rates weren't that bad at the moment overall. What sort of fuckery is going on with the numbers to be able to allow your world and the world of low unemployment to exist? Together? Well, We've we've ended up with the best of all possible worlds, haven't we, Chris? We've got the we've got low unemployment and also low work. And so, how do you add it? Low work, low uh, unemployment, and what's the rest of it? Oh, it's the people who aren't looking for work. I remember now. So we've got this uh, we've got this circumstance, which of course only a fabulously affluent society could afford without immediately careening into disaster. You know, we can eventually careen into disaster with this, I guess, but we can postpone it for quite a while. Um, and this is, this is what happens when you're fighting the last war. Our uh, employment statistics are still fighting the Great Depression. So they get great numbers on, or good, as good numbers as they can get, on unemployment, good numbers on work, and then whatever the other thing is, uh, well, that wasn't happening much during the Depression, so here we are. Uh, because anybody that could work would work <laughs> back then. That was the presumption, and and I think it was probably a pretty good presumption. That's very interesting. So I'm I'm currently kind of obsessed with the role of men in the modern world, their retreat from uh, relationships, their retreat from friendships overall. Have you considered if there is a broader dynamic going on here that ties together the general sort of malaise that men are finding themselves in? Um, well, I'm not a philosopher, but I do demographics and I can count. And uh, I mean, I'm a, uh, I'm a, I'm a 67 year old grandfather with four kids, right? And so I am so far from <laughs> the, the forefront of the battlefield right now that I can kind of read it the way I read science fiction and try to kind of understand it. Uh, but the, the idea that, uh, the idea, let's see, how do I put this for a family audience? The idea that young men would not be interested in real live women, uh, would have been kind of, uh, absurd uh 50 years ago did you see so my favorite or most terrifying piece of research that i've seen recently was from pew uh in 19 in uh, 2019 61 percent of men said that they were looking for either casual or long-term relationships in 2023 that number has dropped to 50 percent one in two men between the ages of 18 and 30 aren't looking for either casual or long-term relationships. Now, well, for the men that are listening who have been through that age bracket or in it, you understand the power, the reality distortion field that is the male sex drive between the ages of 18 and 30. The fact that you can have something that happens that can overcome that is yeah. wild. Yeah. yeah, it's like science fiction. Uh, so what's going and, on? Come on, Nicholas. Give me put your best philosopher tinfoil hat on and give me give me your ideas. Yeah, sure. Um, I started looking at this. We're, we're getting away a little bit from men without work, but I think I'll wander back to it. Um, I started looking at this in Japan. The numbers about Japan about uh, uh, two decades ago, when uh, young men and women were not only saying that they were less likely to have had sex by given, you know, 
20, age 25, age 20, whatever, but also saying that they were less interested in this. And at the time, I thought, well, you know, Everybody knows that the Japanese are just separate from the rest of humanity. They see us as all gaijin. They see us as all unspeakably weird. This is just some Japanese thing. Little did I know that this was the leading indicator for where everything else was going to be going. And I had assumed that we were just in our regular garden variety family decay thing and, you know, post uh, war America. But then this um, this new eruption comes along and the, uh, you know, the, the wonderful little devices kind of turn out to be turbocharging this or at least uh, complicit in some sort of way with this. And um, I again defer to my boss, Mary Eberstadt. Um, and Mary has... Uh, I won't say argued, but she has ominously mused about the possibility that nurture and wanting family and wanting children is not something that is hardwired into us in our DNA inviolably, but rather is something more like a muscle that we develop through use and through seeing the same way that little cats know how to climb down from trees if they live with other cats and they get stuck up in the trees if they don't have cats to look at. Oh, okay. So it's kind of like a mimetic. Yes, mime exactly. Rene Girard, a mimesis, yeah. that sort of thing. Yeah. I mean, okay. that's, that's the musing of it. I, you know, yeah, that's uh, interesting. Well, I mean, so there's a guy, uh, Stephen Shaw. You familiar with Stephen? I, I've heard the name. Yeah. Yeah, so he did Birth Gap, which is a fantastic mm -hmm. documentary. I know that you're big I on your. I talked to him. I talked to him a while ago. I haven't seen the documentary. He was in Qatar with me, so he ah. had a debate a couple of days after me. So we got to go for a bunch of lunches and dinners while I was out there. Also yeah. brought him on the show. I thought he was absolutely fantastic. Um, yeah. I mean, going back to the men in work thing, but also feel free to fold demographic yeah. collapse in as well. How worried are you about all this? Well. I'm worried about it as a citizen. I'm worried about it as a researcher. I'm worried about it as a parent and, you know, a grandparent and somebody who'd like to see, you know, our society continue. Um, things can turn around. Things, things don't always head in a linear direction. In fact, they seldom seem to head for very, very long in the linear direction. This 50-year trend in uh, the exit from the labor force is a pretty long linear trend. Uh, it's, it's exceptional in that way, I think. Um, what will turn it around, I think, is, uh, some, uh, is not going to be uh, economic and uh, structural change. It's going to be a change in people's viewpoints and values and metaphysics. We've had, um, as you know, we've had a couple of uh, great awakenings in the United States in the past. We've had other little eruptions. Uh, it's going to be a change in mindset, and uh, I don't see I don't see why we can't have a change in mindset. As a you know, as a social observer analyst, I can tell you that our tools are poor enough that it takes us a while even to recognize when a change has already started. So for all we could know, it, you know this conversation has already started and I'm too you know, blind and weak to have detected it yet. Are you alluding to the fact that a social change to be able to give some mm -hmm. sympathy support to the chunk of men that are in this 7 million? Um. Not just, yes, yes, of course, of course, empathy and support. I mean, we have an extraordinary empathy gap in the United States today. Uh, we can't even, uh, people who are in the intellectual classes and the describing classes can't accurately describe the arguments of people with whom they disagree because of, because those arguments are bad and evil. You know, they can't even do the intellectual thing of describing this accurately. I mean, that's a huge empathy gap. Um, but more than that, I think um, uh, f finding um, finding spiritual and other meaning in life that takes you outside of yourself and 
reattaches you to humanity and to eternity. That's going to be a challenge given how atomized our devices have made mm-hmm. us. You know, mm-hmm. if you even if you want to go secular with this, right, and you want to say, yeah. um, join a local pickleball club, uh, pick up trash, look after the local dogs, mm-hmm. you join an art class, do yoga, do whatever, right? Yep. For as long as you have a incredibly convenient, incredibly mm-hmm. distractible, a uh, highly distracting device that sits in your pocket, getting yourself mm-hmm. up off the couch on an evening time is going to be hard. If you're spending two thousand hours per year on the couch playing video games, smoking weed, it, it, there's a very high bar for you to get over there. Amen, amen. And uh, and I can't tell you what the next big innovation is, whether it's going to be a chip in the head or uh, what the next uh, virtual reality or yeah, whatever. It yeah, might well, be. And, well, virtual reality is already here. Sure, I mean, just it'll get better and uh, and more uh, more enticing. Um, it's it's going to have to. Uh, it's going to have to come from uh, you know from each from people themselves, and it uh, it can it may be a it may be a revulsion, it may be a sad learning process, but um, I don't I don't have any doubt that uh, that we won't we won't entire we will not entirely be enslaved by this. There'll be some sort of a reaction which will I think help to uh, help to open people's minds again. Oddly, the revolution actually sounds like quite a good thing, although that's not usually what I would say. There's uh, one other element that I've been playing with for nearly a year now, which is given the highest ever rates of male sexlessness that we've seen, Mm -hmm. this sort of despondency in terms of the Mm -hmm. lack of work and meaning and so on and so forth, why hasn't young male syndrome kicked in? Why isn't it that guys are running around, setting cars on fire and pushing over granny and graffitiing walls and stuff like that? Uh, And to me, it seems like the most obvious potential outlet is that they're being sedated by screens, porn, easy access to video games, social media, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that seems to be the most obvious one. And the problem that you have, it's like a, a perfect um, marriage of what you've taught me today and what I already kind of knew, which is if you are part of a previously identified uh, beneficiary of a system, the ability for the people now in charge of that system to give you sympathy and to try and raise you up is going to be so low. No one is going to come and say, why don't we spend more time raising up men, especially, you know, predominantly white, predominantly American men. Who's going to come along and do that? There's no card carrying campaign. And it's the exact same people. You said it earlier on. They they haven't galvanized themselves into one group that goes down the street with placards, waving things, and creating social media campaigns. I think it's going to be a spontaneous movement. Um, I think it's highly unlikely that something will be organized and developed, much less centrally uh, centrally distributed from Washington. Um, on, but the proposition that something will generate spontaneously and spread like a prairie fire would not surprise me. So when people see something good, they want more of it. Just one final thing. What's the economic cost of this? What's the economic cost of of this group of people being outside of the workforce? Uh, well, it, it means uh, it means slower uh, slower economic growth for the country as a whole, and but not just that it means bigger income and wealth gaps. It means more welfare dependence. It probably means more public debt. It means you have to start doing the second order impact on fragile families and the third order impact on what this means for trust in social institutions. I haven't tried to do a, you know a whole of parts calculation on this but it's it's a big economic cost and it's an enormous moral cost to our society Nicholas Eberstadt ladies and gentlemen Nicholas I really really enjoy this I think that this insight is one that much 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 more people should be talking about uh, where can people go if they want to keep up to date with the work that you do um, 
you can probably, for uh, for the foreseeable future, use St. Google to look for Nicholas Eberstadt. Uh, I've got this book, uh, Men Without Work. You can probably find that uh, somewhere. Uh, I have a uh, I have a scholars web page at the American Enterprise Institute, AEI dot org. Nicholas Eberstadt. Nicholas, I appreciate you. Thank you for today. Hey, thank you for making the time for me. What's happening, people? Thank you very much for tuning in. If you enjoyed that episode, then press here for a selection of the best clips from the podcast over the last few weeks. And don't forget to subscribe. Peace.